Hello and, uh, and good evening, uh, everybody, and welcome to our uh, the third in our series, Catholic Higher Education in Light of Catholic Social Thought, a set of four conversations we are hosting based on an edited volume of essays by Bernard G. Prusak and Jennifer Reed Bully. Uh, this collection is called Catholic Higher Education in Light of Catholic Social Thought, Critical Constructive Essays, a forthcoming, pardon me, from Paulus Press later in 2021. And the talks we're hosting uh, are four parts of a 13-part series taking place in Zoom spaces across the country this spring. And please see our web pages for details. And we link up with uh, Bernard's page and Jennifer's page at their institutions, uh, uh, King's College and uh, College of St. Mary. So um, congrats to Jennifer and Bernard. My name is Michael Murphy, and I direct the Hank Center here at Loyola. And on behalf of uh, university leadership, and on behalf of the Hank family, whose generous gift supports our wide programming and initiatives, I extend to you a hearty greeting tonight. Uh, a kind welcome also from our dedicated center staff, our center manager, Megan Toomey, and our graduate student assistant, Kathleen McNutt. Megan and Kathleen are most instrumental in preparing and promoting our events, and I remain grateful for their great work. <clears throat> so thanks to you two. Uh, tonight's event is called Help Wanted, labor policies, problems, and opportunities at the crossroads of Catholic higher education. Um, you know, so many of us this evening are possessed by a deep vocational sense of teaching and learning and by a profound love for the premise, project, and promise of Catholic higher education. Uh, Dr. Joseph McCartan, Dr. Daniel Rhodes, both are built this way as well. And Dr. Joseph McCartan is our main speaker from Georgetown. Joe's reflections for this project, uh, Bernard's and Jennifer's project, that, that is, begins by naming the major forces that have reshaped the US economy and higher education over the past half century. He then examines how these, these forces have affected not only the environment in which Catholic colleges and universities operate, but the internal dynamics of those institutions. For example, the outsourcing of services, the use of contingent adjunct faculty, the erosion of tenure, opposition to unions, and so on. He then reframes the terrain and the questions by providing more just and sustainable alternatives, so many of which derive from Catholic social teaching, Catholic social thought, so as to encourage Catholic colleges and universities to recall themselves to themselves. Our respondent, Dr. Daniel Rhodes of Loyola, our colleague here, has read Dr. McCartan's points and will provide a response based on his scholarship and reflection. We then, as a group, will spend the rest of our time thinking together, dialoguing about the ways Catholic colleges and networks that uh, support them might come together to work towards a better embodiment of mission through the resources, precisely the resources of Catholic social thought, teaching, and practice. So just a little housekeeping as always before we begin. And the first is to put our eyes, you've already done this with our welcome slide, but we have two big events coming. Uh, the first is March 11th, War, Peace and the Catholic Imagination. Uh, join us with National Book Award winning novelist, Phil Cly and multiple award winning poet, Philip Metris, uh, who will discuss how violence, warfare and oppression are mediated through an imagination that knows the profound failure of such human endeavors. That's part of our conversations on the Catholic Imagination series. Uh, then also please on the 23rd, join us for uh, Beyond Patriarchy, another, another in this series, uh, the Catholic Social Thought, Catholic Higher Ed series with uh, Kat Catherine Putzelman Limos from University of Detroit Mercy. And of course, Kathleen Moss Weigert from Loyola. That's gonna be a very um, uh, engaging conversation just like tonight will be. So please be our guest. Registration's uh, free, but please click away online. Just one note on our format before I introduce our esteemed guests. And again, for those who are old hands at our meetings here, it is a meeting, which means that while the chat is limited, we do use chat for questions, but please direct them to me as your host. Uh, so just write me, you'll find my name in the, on your chat uh, bar and Michael P. Murphy, Michael Murphy. And if you have a comment or a question, 
just as you think of it, write it in there. Um, as I'm listening, I'm looking at the chat and I will collate, collect, and I just keep on trying to get as many of these things in play as I possibly can. So if you think about it, write it down and submit it. Thank you very much. And so then let's welcome our speakers. Joseph A. McCartan is professor of history and executive director of the Kalmanovitz Initiative for Labor and the Working Poor at Georgetown University, where he has taught since 1999. His research focuses on the intersection of labor organization, politics, and public policy. He is an award-winning co-author or co-editor of eight books, most recently, Labor in America with Melvin Dubofsky, and more than 130 articles, chapters, and reviews in the fields of labor history and labor studies. Uh, Joe has held fellowships or visiting appointments from the National Endowment of, uh, for the Humanities, the Woodrow Wilson Center, sorry, the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, among a host of others. Joe is contributing editor to Labor, Studies and Working Class History, and his writing has appeared in a range of popular venues as well. Joe is a member of the board of, Catholic, of the Catholic Labor Network and the Albert Shanker Institute. So welcome, Joe. Uh, Daniel P. Rhodes is clinical associate professor and director of contextual education at the Institute of Pastoral Studies here at Loyola University of Chicago. His work crosses the divides between the academy, the church, and society with an emphasis on community organizing, education, ecclesiology, political theology, and ethics. His latest co-edited book, with Charles, Mar Charles Marsh and Shea Tuttle is, Can I Get a Witness? 13 Peacemakers, Community Builders, and Agitators for Faith and Justice. And that's out of Erdman's from just, uh, well, I was gonna say last year, 2019. And so uh, now please let us all circle around for help wanted labor policies, problems, and opportunities at the crossroads of Catholic higher education. And welcome Dr. McCartan, the Zoom stage is yours. Thank you so much, Mike, for that nice introduction and for bringing us together tonight. Thanks to Megan and Kathleen for helping make this happen and to Bernard and um, Jennifer for, you know, conceiving this whole idea. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this discussion um, with you, Mike, and um, with Dan um, as we go forward tonight. So let me share my screen so that I can um, have a, an outline to go through with you all tonight to keep me on track. So I want to talk to you about um, this crossroads that we're at, I think, in Catholic labor edu Catholic education, which has a lot to do with the labor question, uh, I would say. Um, all of us know what kind of year we've been going through in the past year. We're about reaching that one year point of, when the coronavirus began to change all of our lives and certainly to challenge Catholic higher education. Challenge it in many ways. And as some of these headlines indicate to, to really um, raise some profound labor questions um, from um, the perspective of how our institutions are operating. Layoffs, cutbacks of all kinds have happened across uh, Catholic higher ed. And I think it's safe to say that we've never been through a year like this in the history of American Catholic higher education. I think what this pandemic has done is helped to, to bring to the surface, however, a lot of things that have been building over a lot of years uh, in Catholic higher ed. I think the big, you could think of this pandemic uh, as I do as a kind of gigantic stress test that's revealed problems in the health of our Catholic higher ed system. Uh, and to reveal problems that I think have been developing over uh, a number of decades even before this point. Um, the aim of this talk is to provide an overview of how those problems have developed, specifically focusing on the question of uh, our labor policies and how we deal with the labor question in our campuses. I think the pandemic has highlighted uh, certain problems that have been long in the making. And I think it presents us with an opportunity to really step back, understand those problems and try to address them. How far back do those problems go? Um, I would argue that they were present 
decades ago. Uh, many people uh, look to the land of Lake statement of 1967 as an important point in the emergence of modern Catholic higher ed. And uh, it's not that the land of Lake statement completely ignored the labor question. As you can see, these highlighted uh, remarks here, uh, they did talk at land of Lakes about uh, the social organization of our campus as being such as to emphasize the university's concern for persons as individuals and for appropriate participation um, by people. And, and they went on to talk about the necessity of basic reorganizations and structure uh, in order not only to achieve greater internal cooperation and participation, but also to share responsibility for the direction more broadly and to enlist wide, wider support within our universities. But what they said about labor issues, it could be argued was quite vague. The words labor, work or worker didn't appear in that statement. Um, it's not uh, that those issues were not present at all uh, at that moment. In fact, uh, at the time, that people were gathering in Land Lakes, everybody there would have well known of a case that had been unfolding at St. John's University uh, over uh, the months prior to the Land Lakes meeting. Beginning in January 1966, a strike took place at St. John's after some faculty were uh, laid off after having organized to demand a greater say in their campus. Um, that labor dispute dragged on for more than a year. Um, it's not as if these disputes were completely unknown, uh, and yet uh, they weren't completely addressed. They weren't directly addressed uh, in 1967, and, and really, uh, you could argue for a long time since then. Um, there were um, forces operating, though, in the years, say, between 1967 and the 1980s, what you could call the Land Lakes era, that more or less kept those issues off the center screen and, and maybe dampened them somewhat. One was that Catholic higher ed was robust and growing in those years. Jobs were emerging as many uh, Americans were enrolling in Catholic, institutions of Catholic higher ed. Uh, an enrollment explosion between 1945 and 1970 that paralleled the, the income growth for many Americans in those years. Uh, the bottom 90% of earners were seeing their wages go up and their children were heading off to institutions, including those of Catholic higher ed. In those years too, we had robust federal support uh, for higher education broadly beginning with the 1958 National Defense Education Act and 1965, the Higher Ed Act that creates a student loan program. Um, and in the mid seventies, you know, states were allocating uh, a, a good deal of money to, to higher ed. Uh, and this helped to shape an atmosphere, I think of robust growth um, that dampened labor issues in the seventies. Uh, colleges and universities in those years, as they were going, uh, did not uh, rely uh, as much as they would later rely on contingent workers and adjuncts, for example. Instead, all kinds of jobs from um, uh, janitorial work to tenured professors were mostly accomplished by long-term direct employees. Um, Conflicts over unionization did happen in those years, but they were pretty rare. Uh, among the places where faculty did organize unions uh, are some of these, like the University of San Francisco, for example. Um, however, unionization for the most part was taken off the table, at least for faculty uh, on tenure lines in uh, Catholic institutions by a Supreme Court decision in 1980 the yeshiva decision, which ruled that uh, tenure line faculty, in fact, had enough managerial responsibility not to be categorized as workers and therefore not to be covered by the National Labor Relations Act. And to this day, at private institutions, um, as a result, unionism never took deep root among 
uh, tenure line faculty. In those years, uh, in part because the labor question was not so explosive, uh, the church was pretty expansive, I, I think, in its broader statements about how Catholic social teaching on labor ought to be applied in Catholic institutions. The past letter from 1986, uh, the bishop's letter uh, on uh, a just economy for all, or economic justice for all, um, said very clearly that all the moral principles that govern the just operation of any economic endeavor apply to the church and its agencies and institutions. Indeed, the church should be exemplary. All church institutions must fully recognize the rights of employees to organize and bargain collectively uh, with the institution through whatever association or organization they freely choose. So the bishops believe that this should be the policy in church affiliated organizations or institutions. Um, the context, however, had already begun to change. Uh, from the mid 1970s, into the early 21st century, forces began to reorganize higher ed in ways that pushed labor questions more to the forefront. And I wanna just um, go over some of those briefly. One was that the overall economy ran into uh, wage stagnation for the great majority of workers after the mid 1970s. The graph on the left there uh, is uh, from the Economic Policy Institute, and probably many people have seen it reproduced before. In one graph, it explains just so much about what happened to our economy over the past um, um, 30 to 40 years and the break that occurred between what people were paid and how productive they were. It used to be that pay and productivity went hand in hand. They both rose together. As workers continued to be productive after the mid 70s, however, their wages did not rise with their rising productivity. And the fruits of that productivity mostly went to employers and stockholders in those years. And not surprisingly then, uh, the graph on the right shows how the 1% began to increase its wealth more in this period and, and the bottom 50% uh, to uh, see a smaller share of wealth over time. As the economy was changing, so was the tax structure of the country, in part brought about by the tax revolt. Uh, Proposition 13 in 1978, many people point to as beginning that. And anti-tax activism began to grow in the late 70s and through the 80s and after in ways that really um, accomplished a remarkable reduction of taxes, especially on the wealthiest as the graph on the left shows. And the US as the bar chart on the right shows ranks pretty low um, compared to other nations in terms of the total tax revenue uh, as a share of GDP. As tax revenue uh, declined proportionally, there was less there to support education uh, and that would become important. Unions also ran into difficulty in these years um, and uh, the, the um, graph there with the red line shows how union uh, membership began to decline uh, in the 60s in relative terms. Uh, and not surprisingly, in some ways, the, the share of wealth that went to the top percent increased along with it. As unions were uh, becoming uh, uh, rarer and finding it harder to make progress for workers. The workplace itself and the employment relationship was being reorganized in many fields, um, including some that would um, have implications for Catholic campuses. Um, the economist David Weil has written a book called The Fishered Workplace that explores this reorganization and how subcontracting and franchising, how the use of longer supply chains or temporary workers has really transformed the employment relationship um, and taken jobs that used to be good jobs and turned them into bad jobs. One of the areas in which this occurred was in janitorial service. Um, in the 19, in the mid 1970s, janitorial work in big cities like Washington uh, or 
uh, Chicago for that matter, was mostly unionized in, in commercial real estate. Office buildings were being cleaned often by union workers, but subcontracting changed that uh, and brought about the rise of subcontracted janitorial services that were much cheaper, that relied on often immigrant and easily exploited labor. That gave rise to fights like the Justice for Janitors fight a flyer of which you see here. Um, as you'll see uh, in, in a moment, I think this transformation had a big impact for how we employed people on our own campuses uh, by the end of the century. And then the economy started to change as well because of the growth of what uh, people often term financialization. The expansion of that part of the economy that's often referred to as the fire sector, finance, insurance, real estate, manufacturing, uh, the light blue line there showing its uh, expansion uh, in terms of its share of GDP being produced there. And as more and more of our economy gravitated toward finance, and as new entities emerged like hedge funds, private equity, and as the philosophy of maximizing shareholder value really took hold on Wall Street after the mid 70s and certainly by the 80s, this changed the, the behavior of our economy in important ways and empowered really a new financial class to have more influence than ever before on the shape of our economy. This was an economy that increased inequality dramatically. Um, and as wages were stagnant, inequality was growing. It's not surprising that many working families turned increasingly to borrowing to, to uh, get ahead and inde indebtedness increased as well. It's right around this time that you actually see uh, college uh, tuition costs, the real cost of higher ed beginning to creep up. Um, and. Uh, much of it being fueled by and uh, borrowing, uh, which makes it possible for people uh, with incomes that aren't rising as fast as inflation to be able to advance their children. Um, all of this was creating what I would call an economy of exclusion and inequality, uh, and an economy that would help to reshape the context within which Catholic higher ed was taking place. And that quote, of course, comes from Pope Francis himself, who has condemned uh, the economy of exclusion and inequality. As these changes were happening, I think they started to change the, the culture and the operation and the structure even to some extent of our institutions of higher ed. First of all, they started to change uh, the, the composition of the leadership of those institutions. Consider, for example, the, the role that people from finance increasingly started to play on the boards of directors of our institutions. By 2015, more than half of board leadership positions at research universities in the country came from the financial sector. sector. Now that's overall, but the same pattern um, holds, I think, in most Catholic institutions. This is the Georgetown board um, today. Um, and in yellow, I've highlighted all the people who come from what could be called the fire sector. In green, people who are from other business sectors. Um, you can see that there are more fire representatives, say, than, than all the other businesses put together. Uh, and that together, uh, people who come from these backgrounds really dominate um, the Georgetown board. And, and I would say that we could find this at the institutions that many of us uh, work at or are familiar with. So our institutions are increasingly run by those who have benefited most from the economy of exclusion and inequality that's developed. I'll come back to that in a moment. What we've also seen at our institutions uh, as this larger context has changed is that they become more unequal within. Those at the top in our institutions in general see their incomes increasing faster than others. And this is true at Catholic as well as other universities. Uh, we did a, a study of uh, IRS form 990s uh, of the Jesuit schools 
um, and found that if you look at the top five non uh, office holding salary earners at these schools uh, and watch what happened to their income between 2001 and 2011, it grew about 29% average faculty uh, during the same period grew 4%. This is what I mean about uh, internally replicating some of the inequalities of the larger economy. Our institutions have also increasingly relied on um, uh, workers who are um, casual employees, um, who are temporary employees, adjuncts especially. Uh, nationally, the proportion of instructors on a 10-year line declined by 25% between 1975 and 2015, while the proportion of non-tenure line faculty rose by 62%. Now, that's across higher education as a whole, uh, but I think you would find that this was replicated at Catholic institutions as well. According to data from the U.S. Department of Education, by 2013, more than half of instruct, instructional faculty at Jesuit colleges and universities were non-tenure line, and 43% were part-time. Uh, that's just to take one sector. So uh, our institutions are beginning to mirror some of the larger trends in the economy. Another way they have mirrored them uh, over the past few decades is by increasingly subcontracting a lot of work that used to be work directly employed. Janitors used to generally work directly for the university. Maintenance workers did. The bookstore used to be, in most cases, run by the university, security people and others. In many cases, you'll find that on our campuses now, there is a different contractor who handles janitorial work, another that handles the bookstore, another that handles security, et cetera. And what Weil and others have documented is that the more subcontracting exists in any sector, the more inequality tends to follow it um, for reasons we could discuss later, but I won't uh, go into deeply here. Just consider one area that is mostly subcontracted at most places. I know this is true at Loyola of Chicago. You also have Aramark uh, on your campus, I believe, as we do at Georgetown. Just take this one food uh, contractor, uh, for example. Aramark CEO's pay rose by 70% during the years I indicate there, 2006 to 2015. That's way faster than the price of food. Uh, it's certainly way faster than the pay of the average food service worker. Uh, and the big growth in college meal plan, plan prices isn't really being driven by the people putting the food on the plate or cooking it, uh, I would argue, as much as by the nature of the structure we're employing to provide this food. Uh, a large multinational, uh, which is concerned above all with its bottom line. And I will say Aramark has been good on some issues. Uh, and I could talk about that more later, but I think overall the tendency toward <coughs> employing these kinds of contractors, I think raises questions. It's also been increasing resistance to unionization uh, across Catholic higher ed. Now remember back in 1986, the bishops argued that Catholic institutions ought to respect workers' rights to organize. The Supreme Court had said tenure line faculty can, at private institutions are not eligible for unions, but many others uh, could be. Um, a deepening struggle, uh, in fact, um, has happened at many of our campuses over the past few decades over the question of unionization. The yeshiva decision was part of shaping the contours of that. Another decision that came out actually a year earlier called NLRB versus Catholic Bishop <coughs> of Chicago, excuse me, also played a role in that. Um, it argued that the board, the National Labor Relations Board did not have jurisdiction over teachers and church operated school and religious freedom grounds. Um, and anybody directly involved in religious uh, instruction under the purview of this decision 
uh, is not covered uh, by uh, labor law. But that leaves a, a lot of people who aren't either tenure line faculty or involved in religious instruction who are at least theoretically uh, able to form unions. One of those groups uh, could be adjunct employees. And certainly um, adjunct uh, employees in the early 20th century began to feel, or the early 21st century, the need to form unions at many locations. An effort to form a union was begun at Manhattan College. That became very important uh, in, in shaping what has happened over the past 15 years or so. That struggle came to a head in 2010 and 11. The university, <coughs> excuse me, Manhattan College really resisted this union effort. And uh, a fight uh, emerged there. Um, that fight drew in the associations of Catholic higher education, the Association of Jesuit Colleges and Universities, um, the Association of Catholic Colleges and Universities, uh, and others. And they took the side of the university resisting the union, uh, uh, arguing that it did not have a place uh, on these campuses. Um, Georgetown, by the way, took a different tack in this period, um, following its own um, internal policy called the Just Employment Policy, which it created in 2005. Georgetown uh, committed to all working members having the right to freely associate and organize, that the university would respect that right uh, to bargain. And in fact, the university agreed not to fight the union, but to allow adjuncts to decide for themselves whether they wanted one, most chose one. Um, in 2014, uh, the National Labor Relations Board in a case called Pacific Lutheran basically decided that other uh, adjuncts at, at uh, similar universities, uh, religious universities, as long as they weren't involved in religious instruction could uh, make the same decision. And that set off fights at many campuses uh, whose unions, whose adjuncts tried to unionize. Seattle University was one, it strongly resisted uh, the union as well. Um, Fordham, however, uh, broke with this trend in 2018 uh, and decided uh, to uh, allow the union to, to, to form there and to stop resistance to it. Um, but um, the controversy continued um, uh, because in uh, two years later, the, the same board uh, under Obama, the National Labor Relations Board, in this decision called Columbia, allowed graduate assistants to begin to form unions as well. And this set off another round in this battle. Many institutions fought back against the organization of their graduate assistants, Boston College uh, being one. Uh, it argued that graduate student unionization in any form would undermine the collegial mentoring relationship at the uh, college. Georgetown again took a different approach uh, in that case. Uh, and uh, it uh, concluded a private agreement with uh, the union that was forming there, a branch of the AFT, to allow for uh, a uh, an independent entity, the American Arbitration Association, to hold an election. The graduate students of Georgetown did vote to have a union, and they do have one. But since um, the Trump board's Bethany decision of 2020, uh, um, union, unionization has pretty much uh, run into a brick wall at most Catholic institutions. Um, it uh, again uh, argued that um, unionization should not be, uh, that, that employees at these institutions involved in instruction uh, should not you know, be forced to abide by the National Labor Relations Act because it would be infringing on the religious liberty. Come back to that later. Uh, while this fight over unions and Catholic higher ed had become a legal war, it's important to recognize that these institutions could recognize unions without government involvement. Georgetown did this with its adjuncts, and yet most chose to hide behind religious freedom arguments to resist unionization. 
In short, the praxis of Catholic higher ed, I think, was increasingly becoming, as all these examples, I think, at least speak to me to say, increasingly becoming disconnected from Catholic social teaching on the rights and dignity of workers. So this was the state of Catholic higher ed on the eve of the pandemic. A labor problem had been emerging over about 40 years or so. Um, features of that problem involved a lot of mirroring on our campuses of larger economic trends. And the growth of trends like these were putting our institutions, in my view, in increasing conflict with their own teachings regarding worker rights. And that's what I think the pandemic has pushed up to the surface for us now. Um, so the pandemic's impact, what has it done? I think the pandemic is exposing our growing labor problem, I think in a, in a way we cannot escape in an acute way as our institutions now have to make difficult choices all too often without consultation uh, or without sufficient consultation, let alone negotiation with the people who are most affected by those choices with the workers impacted by them. And I think that grows out of a history now of not providing sufficient voice for those people. I think second, we need to acknowledge that the dangers inherent in this moment are more than economic. They go to the soul of Catholic higher ed and to our ability to put our values into practice. And, and third, meeting this crisis will not be easy, uh, clearly, for its causes transcend both the pandemic, this moment, and the parameters of any single institution of ours. Indeed, they transcend Catholic higher ed writ large they're embedded in what's been happening to higher ed overall and to our society over the past 40 years. And people have responded in varying ways to this pandemic uh, so far. Uh, a lot of it, I think, unfortunately, has been what I would call unilateralist austerity where our institutions, and admittedly, they feel pressed to the wall, are making decisions about layoffs and cutbacks and other things, but often making them without any apparent consultation. Uh, and instituting an austerity program, that's really non-negotiable. Um, and I think that that's unfortunate. Again, I don't uh, want to minimize the problems places are facing, but I think that that, that reveals a, a problem. I think others have tried to respond with humane creativity, but also with insufficient consultation or negotiation or buy-in, and I would include Georgetown even in that. We've come up, I think, with a very creative, uh, our, uh, university did a very creative program. And instead of laying off some people who might have been laid off, they tried to come up with a program that would redeploy people to, to jobs like um, becoming health monitors, uh, contact tracers, and others. But they didn't consult enough with the workers uh, about this program enough in advance to be able to get buy-in from people. And a lot of people at the last minute were given an ultimatum, either accept this transfer or be laid off. And if people didn't accept the transfer uh, and then they chose to, and some felt like that would be uh, putting them in a, in a health situation, they would be um, uh, compromised health-wise. If they didn't accept um, alternative work, they would be ineligible for unemployment. And so there have been protests about that at Georgetown um, in recent weeks. And then I think we've seen also across a Catholic higher ed <coughs> growing um, resistance and conflict around some of this that's been occurring. Um, uh, a lot of protests emerging, uh, not just on Georgetown campus, as I've just noted, but in other places, I think, it, as many of you are familiar with and know about. Um, and that's given rise to, I think, some creative um, efforts. I, I would cite the Coalition of Jesuit Higher Ed Workers and Students. And I know there are some people at Loyola Chicago involved in this, and I believe that people at 20 different Jesuit institutions have now joined this coalition. They are protesting 
some of what's been happening um, at many of these institutions. And what I think is most important about what they're doing is they're bringing people across institutions together. They're trying to center values and they are trying to, to push a question that I think all of us need to grapple with. Um, and more about that in questions perhaps, but what's the road forward? I think we can meet this crisis. I think we can meet it by drawing upon our values. I think we can meet it by thinking creatively, collectively and beyond our individual institutions. I think we can make it or we can meet it if we come together and add our voices both individually and collectively to efforts to achieve um, policies at the institutional level, at the sectoral level of higher ed uh, and, and broadly in our economy that will relieve some of the pressure that's pushing us toward uh, contradicting our own teachings regarding work and workers. So this is clearly a, a, a profoundly difficult moment, but I think it also challenges us and invites us to move out of patterns that have been developing over the years and, and really return to first principles. Um, and with that, I will, I will um, stop and um, I look forward to hearing um, uh, my colleague Dan's thoughts about this and then to your questions. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, uh, it makes me sitting through this presentation and looking and hearing it and looking through this data, it makes me just wish I could sit in on one of your classes uh, uh, along the way. Um, I wanna say thanks again to Mike uh, for emceeing and to Bernard and Jennifer for this series of important conversations. Already you can get a sense here of why this is such an important conversation uh, surrounding Catholic social thought and, and the Catholic university. And uh, also thanks to Megan and Kathleen as well for coordinating. Um, and wow, what a thoughtful contribution this is. And I'm, I'm really thrilled to have the chance to respond to it. Um, now, I only have eight minutes to respond, uh, which seems uh, a little bit to me like a breach of Catholic social teaching here, but uh, uh, anyway. We'll give so, you a little dispensation there, Dan. <laughs> thanks, Mike. Uh, so I'm going to cut right to the chase, though. Uh, now, I take it that one of the central things that Professor McCartan uh, has been saying is that the lords and magnates of the new Gilded Age learned the lesson of the Roosevelt New Deal in the post-war period and that the strategies of their neoliberal revolution have been much more effective, not only in ridding the economic sphere of any interference, but also by infusing that economic logic into institutions and firms of all types, shaping them into the kind of private governments with dictator administrations described by Elizabeth Anderson. So private governments with dictator administrations means that all these things that Joe was just talking about, about the, the lack of negotiation, the inability to, to kind of uh, create relations of accountability, to have discussions about workplace uh, and job conditions. Uh, so fewer union powers, uh, job protections, uh, forced ob arbitration clauses, uh, declining real co-governance. Um, like other universities, Catholic higher ed institutions have been happy to swim with the tide of internal depoliticization that increasingly renders all universities in the US what we might call hedge funds attached to a campus. We too, meaning us uh, Catholic, those in Catholic higher ed and Catholic institutions have joined the horse trading carousel of super manager CEO presidents. We've experienced the bloating of managerial personnel. After all, someone has to supervise and manage these workers now laboring under such conditions. Our boards and regents are increasingly dominated by business and finance perspectives. Subcontracting more and more ser uh, services has become normalized. And we have not been immune to be, uh, ballooning adjunct faculties and what we might call gigification uh, more broadly. And when necessary, we've been, even been willing to deploy religious exemption for the purpose of disciplining labor so as to decrease workforce friction and resistance while we yield more and more to the influence of endowments and profits. So more broadly, that is to say, the, the iron cage of best practices, and isn't that always the language? 
Uh, this is how these things get talked about and get negotiated. The iron cage of best practices now sets the conditions within which the business of higher education goes on, even for Catholic universities. Uh, as Alistair McIntyre observes in his book on the topic, uh, quote, research universities are wonderfully successful business corporations, subsidized by tax exemptions and exhibiting all the acquisitive ambitions of such corporations. He then goes on to suggest that what gets lost from view consequently are the relations between the disciplines in a university and any sense of a shared enterprise by that institution or by that university to which each of these disciplines contributes, such that fragmentation is the result under capitalist pressure. Simply opening up more space for market and financial interests to fill the void of purpose, if you will. Hence, matching their institutional structure with the mission of our schools. So the institutional structure, the form, the structure of the institution itself, its organized structure, and the mission of our schools. A certain homology even weaves its way into our curriculums as more and more Catholic higher education institutions focus on what we tend to call the press, uh, pressing issues of human concern so long as that human takes the form of homo economicus. Now I'm gonna come back to this in a little bit because it's one of the things I wanna propose uh, in, in response to Dr. McCartan as a question. It, it, it emerges around this. But suffice it to say, as he notes, the pandemic has only accelerated these wider twin trends, making them just more obvious, even as such moves are enjoined with the language of shared sacrifice or teamwork. Uh, one example at a non-Catholic university is just up the road from Loyola at Northwestern. Uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, Northwestern announced it was cutting nearly 450 employees. Now, Northwestern University, you can research this very easily just by Googling it, has a $9 billion endowment. If an endowment is not for something like a global, global pandemic, I have no idea what an endowment is for. Uh, remarkably, uh, and this is recent reporting that has come out, Northwestern has reported a budget surplus in 2020 during this pandemic even while these furloughed employees were left to rely on student groups to raise aid money for them. So it seems that workers are disposable completely in a disposable culture as uh, Pope Francis might say it. Now what becomes awkward at times for Catholic institutions is the tradition of social thought its Catholic heritage, heritage ties it to with its arcane language of the right to unionize, of just economies, the dignity of labor, uh, even participatory governance. And yet, this has only proved a minor hindrance to the capitalist capture of the university. For one of the geniuses of cultural capitalism is its ability to dress itself up in the garments of progressivism and humanitarianism. Hence, cura personalis, persons for others, human dignity, and even solidarity can be fit onto neoliberal firms and homo economicus by trading on the ambiguity that tends to haunt the principles of Catholic social teaching themselves, even if such clothing remains a bit baggy or loose in places. As Marx reminds us, capitalism loves theological niceties and too often a crude mystification seems at work here where attaching a Latin name to any content renders it holy and sacred. I mean, who isn't a fan of human rights or the dignity of labor or even community participation and decision-making these days? I mean, you hear this stuff all over the place. Triple bottom line is a theme for Exxon and Apple as much as it is for anyone else. If you can put Che Guevara on a t-shirt and sell it to high schoolers, capturing things like magis or addressing areas of human concern is mere child's play. These just become the socially palatable side of the shell company. So how can Catholic universities go forward? How can they resist some of these trends, uh, some of this tide that, can, that, that, that we've been swimming with? How might we return to a more, uh, to a more of a terra firma of moral guidance on labor relations and university governance uh, from these volatile seas of neoliberal economic logic upon which we've been adrift? I have three. 
And these are question suggestions kind of wrapped all together in one. Uh, the first question I have uh, to this just wonderful presentation again by uh, Professor McCartan is, uh, do you see a unique responsibility for senior faculty to take a leading role in a push to align university policies and practices with Catholic social thought, especially around labor struggles? So given the precarity of so many young adjunct faculty who increasingly come to their jobs with debt, housing insecurity, uh, and you know, look around with fewer job options, uh, do not more senior faculty need to heed the call to engage in this fight? I think many of us are a bit disheartened by the sense that while our senior faculty colleagues will complain about university policies and lack of co-governance, so few can be found on the front lines of the struggle. I think this is one of the things marginalized persons have been saying for quite some time. Solidarity is counted not in sentimentality, feeling, spirit, or even understanding. It's counted in bodies. Now, my second question uh, then kind of follows on this first question. Is there not a need to push for new board appointees and presidential figures? If the issue of labor is also an issue of leadership, given the degree to which what currently charts the trajectory of the adrift vessel of the Catholic University is not a shared enterprise or a higher good, but simply the unalterable, if impossible to understand, forces of the global market, such that to interfere in labor market negotiations or endowment management is really to play Prometheus to the market god, then do we not need to alter the entire class of leaders who now lead our institutions? I'm thinking here of the need to have leaders who understand the good of university education, not just for some career skills, but for more comprehensive and, uh, and higher goods of human community, common good, collective participation and shared work. So instead of a class of super managers as the economist Thomas Piketty has called them, would it not be more important to have leaders who do have loyalties and deep relationships with the faculty and staff that labor in the institution? I'm, I'm thinking here, you know, one of the things that we see in higher education is that as new administrations come in, it's almost important to get them from, from uh, locations and uh, in places where they are not connected to the local labor force. So that when they come in, the kind of ripping and tearing that's necessary to kind of continue to, to make the hard decisions that austerity require uh, don't, don't become entrapped by these kinds of loyalties or relational integuments. Again, this will mean faculty and staff taking a more active role, not just in the interviewing of candidates, right? So every time we interview somebody, there's always kind of, hey, faculty participation or staff participation, but in determining who gets to be a candidate in the first place and who sits on the board that appoints these leaders. Um, so that's kind of the push on the leadership uh, structures of the university. And, our, and particularly our Catholic universities. And then my third, and, and finally, so this is my final one, and it's probably the, the biggest and most controversial question suggestion on how to re-anchor Catholic universities in Catholic social teaching. And that is to pose the possibility of the need to recover moral theology as an interdisciplinary discourse across the various departments of the Catholic university. What I mean here, and I, I really wanna be clear about this, is not to reinstitute theology as the queen of the sciences or some kind of doctrinal court uh, on other fields and disciplines. But if it is true that one of the casualties within this historical development of the Catholic university has been the marginalization of moral theology itself, may this not also be what has rendered Catholic social teaching so inconsequential for university labor policies, as well as the legal counsel and the human resource best practices that have led to such suffocating workplace conditions? One place where this becomes uh, particularly a posit is in the way a kind of fact value distinction already dic dictates the possibilities of any labor policy nego in negotiation. Because according to the facts, uh, uh, these are set by financial departments, market logics, and the cold realities of a business legal fusion such that they call the shots. Thus, values are too easily manipulated into a patina that's glossed across a, a profit-driven, endowment-driven institution, right? So when you already have this fact-value distinction, it's business, finance, uh, you know, market logics that set the facts, 
And then the values come later, right? So the values then become something we negotiate as we deal with the facts. What we need, I think, uh, and this is maybe to press the point a bit, are not values, but a new kind of moral theology that interrogates such distinctions and even puts to question some of the most taken for granted principles of the capitalist world we inhabit. I wonder if instead of cutting theology departments and faculties uh, and cutting classes across our university, we should on the contrary be introducing courses on moral theology. Even better, we should, uh, should we not be creating interdisciplinary engagements with moral theology throughout the curriculum of the Catholic University so that the business persons and lawyers who end up engaging around la labor issues in the future are not so predetermined by the facts of the market, only to have them simply hang the banner of values on these already colonized options. Such a move could even recover moral theology. I think it might do us a favor, right? Uh, us moral theo theologians, uh, by recovering moral theology from its docetic distortions focused on the cure of souls, where souls seem aloof from the real working conditions, healthcare needs, debt, and physical goods of active human bodies. Now, again, I realize this may be controversial, but my sense is that we're way past controversy at this point. In risking such controversy, however, might our Catholic universities actually find not only some moorings for their own existence, but also something unique to offer in this nihilistic climate? Thank you so much. And thank you again, Dr. McCarty. Thank you, Daniel Rhodes. Thank you, Joseph McCartan. Incredibly substantive uh, talks and responses. There's so much there. We have about 15 minutes. Uh, I have a lot of questions to navigate here, so I'm going to get on the move. Just want to respond quickly to, to Dan, who's responding to Joe. But you know, to to increase the uh, the, uh, the the reach of theology, uh, you know, and I mean, I, hey, I totally agree. But then, what again? The structures are driving it. The kind of neoliberalism trickle down stuff, which you know, is theology a revenue bearing enterprise? Right. And then, you know, is the math department revenue bearing? So if we're going to have that battle as we professionalize the humanities, we we don't have in the mindset, we don't have the we don't have the tools to fight that battle. So uh, there's a reason why there's a kind of patronage or a patrona, you know, the female variant to the to the humanities because they're needed for, uh, you know, so. You know, there's so much here and in Bernard and Jennifer's book there, I think um, Anna Moreland uh has a chapter on that um so uh anyway but let me just jump in here with uh, uh something from Therese Lysot who's uh, a colleague here at Loyola and she uh wants to kind of uh, get a comment from either of you on outsourcing food service and environmental services this type of thing so you you outsource these people these workers and many things happen uh Joe, you mentioned inequality is sure to sure to follow quickly. Teresa uh, is citing uh, this is a large group of people of color on campus as well, uh, and it cuts them off from the benefits of of, of, of tuition reductions and other benefits. So, can you comment largely on that, Joe? You first. That's an excellent point, and thank you for that question. Yeah, I think. Back in the day when food service workers were directly employed, they did have access to those kind of benefits. That's one of the things that's occurred. And absolutely, the janitorial, the, the food service workers, they're overwhelmingly workers of color uh, or immigrants or both, you know? And um, so uh, that's, a, that's an excellent point. Yeah. You know, uh, Dan, you can jump in if you like. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, it's such an important point, because I think one of the things that sometimes gets lost in wider discussions is there's, uh, you know, you're either involved in labor issues or you're involved in issues around, you know, race or whatever it might be. And I think what we what what this continues to bring up is that that class divisions are apartheid divisions. Right. And, and, and I think in many ways, uh, when we begin to see them then, that way, uh, the kind of principles of something like Catholic social teaching, Catholic social thought, uh, can then give us a way to kind of say, hey, the, these are about, you know, uh, these hang together. These are not disparate issues in that sense. I agree, you know, and it really gets a sense of mission. And, and the CST is a differentiator. It's, it's uniquely, it's what we have that, that really separates us from, 
the work at Kenyon College may be, they have their own mission or Cal State's Stanislaus, you name it. Um, and so a more robust, um, invigorated engagement with it, you know, because when you disaggregate, when you, the inequality happens for these people who, who lost their job and are contracted out. But what else happens is a, is a disaggregation of mission and, a, and a, you know, and so I don't know if that's too idealistic because I, I, I could be accused of being idealistic. You know, and, and you hear things like, you know, budgets are moral documents. So where are we putting our money? And you hear things like, well, you know what? No, you know, no margin, no mission, right? And then, you know, maybe you could also flip that over and say, well, you know, no mission, no margin. That's what's, that's what's separated us. You know, and is that, is that an idealism? So I want to give you a question of my own, just to, for the sake of, uh, you know, devil's, devil's advocate, or, you know, we have to be realists here too, because we are tuition dependent. And uh, I can't think of a harder job than to, than to do budgets, you know? Um, and so I have a lot of respect for people who manage these things and they keep the lights on. So, um, and, you know, we don't want to drive up, we want fair wages for everybody and access to, to equity, but then are we going to drive the tuition up? So how do you think about those questions? And Joe, please begin. Yeah, I think um, one thing is um, we could say, Mike, is it's not the tuition or it's not the, the pay of the janitor, or the food service worker that's driving tuition uh, for the most part. And in the Aramark case, what I think that helps show is that any increases in college meal plans, it's, they're not being driven by the, the workers for the most part. So um, that's one, one part of it. But I, I agree with you that we have to be realistic you know, and we have to think in real terms about what's possible. But I think that that needs to make us step back and, and like get out of the box we're in. Because yes, we are tuition dependent um, and we're likely to remain that, that is Catholic higher ed. Um, you know, no, most you know, Catholic schools don't have endowments like Northwesterns for the most part. Um, so, you know, we do replicate that at some level, but but it's not the same. We, we need tuition. But what we also need is a healthy public system of higher ed. When I say public, I mean uh, we need public policy that upholds both uh, public and private higher ed. Um, and, and, you know, just to, to one thing that, by the way, um, I just want to thank Dan Rhodes very much for those eloquent comments and so pointed. There's so much in them. But I don't have time to address most of that, but I'll just say one thing, and that is about the leadership um, of our boards, you know, and he was asking about, like, you know, what kind of people should be on these boards. And we need to do more to educate the people who are on these boards about the values of Catholic social teaching. I think that's for sure. But th this is what I would also say is that those people um, who are on these boards, um, who come from the kind of backgrounds I noted on the Georgetown board, for example, I think above all, they need to be paying more taxes. They need to be paying more. They're too, they're, I would just say part of our problem is there's too much money. Uh, that's concentrated in the hands of the 1% or the 0.1%. And I heard Elizabeth Warren talking um, earlier today about her 2% or her 2 cent wealth tax. I mean, if we made it a 3 cent wealth tax, we could revolutionize higher ed uh, with the revenue generated by that. Um, and we could help re reverse some of the, these problems. Now, um, the Biden administration, God bless them, they're going to push through a, um, an infrastructure bill. We need that. But we also need the infrastructure of American higher education. In some ways, it's the crown jewel of the country. And we are not investing public funds in making this a healthy system to the extent we need to. We have a structural problem. Uh, and as long as we're fighting on the institutional level about nickels and dimes of our budgets, uh, we're not going to be able to deal with with these larger questions. I think we got to expand our vision. You know, Joe, there were 44 million jobs lost between April and June 2020. A lot of them women because of domestic situations, you know, and uh, but the market's booming and the billionaires have, you know, and again, I don't want to 
I don't want to engender a false class war, but we, you'd have to be living under a rock not to see the eradication of the middle class and the increase of the working poor. Uh, Dan, do you want to say anything about any of those topics? Well, I, I mean, they're all so important. And one of the things that I think and, and, and is in some sense, it's just demystifying that this is the way things have to go, right? The, the sense that, um, you know, even at, uh, you know, let's say second tier uh, Catholic universities, you know, you're not Notre Dame. We're trying to move in that direction, right? There's nothing wrong with being a, a re, you know, a tuition driven institution. Like, why did that become a bad thing? Right. You know that, yeah, it introduces some precarity. I get it. But but maybe that's a good way to live out Catholic social thought. Right. Um, so so I think in some sense there's there's, you know, our kind of our realism even gets shaped in a in a, in a particular trajectory so that we we end up. And, and you know, this, I think, it introduces something interesting for a for a Catholic system. Right. Um, the difference between seeing each other as competitors and maybe saying, well, hey, you know, if the Princeton Review is not going to, or, or whoever is not going to rank us as a top research university, well, maybe together we establish our own sense of what that means to be a strong Catholic research university, right? Thank you. I'm going to read three, three uh, questions from people to get the voices involved. It's from Jason Dahl. Uh, what are, and just jot down maybe a thought, if you wouldn't mind, what are viable solutions to these issues? I that is outsourcing the use of adjuncts, erosion of tenure, opposing unions. You know, what would you suggest? Um, Henry Whittacombe says, hey, how, how even in good conscience uh, can Catholic universities ever be opposed to union, unionization of its workers? Uh, Amory Cunningham, along with um, Heidi, I think they're, look, we have, we have such a great uh, array of, labor docs from the from the magisterium and in the wealth of Catholic social teaching, you know, rerum novarum, but much more. Uh, Heidi, uh, I think Anne Marie is alluding to, to uh, laborum exertions by uh, John Paul II. And I'll, I'll, I guess I'll read Heidi's question. Can both speakers please speak, uh, address the distinction between direct and indirect employer and how it might illuminate this discussion? Uh, and how it might illuminate responsibilities uh, that we have for addressing these challenges in Catholic higher ed. And she says, thank you. Uh, I guess sprayed things at you. So anything you want to say to any of that? Dan, we can start with you this time. Uh, so, I mean, I, I think um, one of the things that I think is, is, from my perspective, is to put into question some of the, the basic assumptions of, uh, you know, that you were talking earlier and this question came about outsourcing, subcontracting. Um, you know, in my organizing work, we've done a lot of work around wages and around, uh, you know, fights for living wages. And a lot of the research shows that it's actually not cheaper to subcon, to, 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 you know, have a rotating workforce, to have temporary employees. That to not pay living wages. That in many ways, actually, you get a steady, higher quality of work from having some of the securities of those kinds of things. So I think in some ways, um, you're not always choosing between, oh, wow, we're going to fall off the cliff. You know, Joe already made this point. It's, it's not, you know, these, these are not the folks driving up the tuition dollars. They're not the ones who are going to put the university at jeopardy if we treat people fairly. Um, uh, with, I'll let Joe maybe deal with the question of direct or indirect employer, uh, other than to say, you know, I, I think in some ways, um, from my perspective, sometimes indirect employment is a way to skirt some of the frictions and resistances that might be intrinsic uh, to direct employment. But I'll let, Joe's definitely more an authority on that. Well, Dan, thanks. Um, you know, in terms of indirect employment, how to, how to deal with that problem? Well, Georgetown was, um, has come up with, I think, a good model on that. And I would refer people to our just employment policy. You can Google just employment policy Georgetown and you'll find it. What we do is we re require any subcontractor to pay a certain wage. Uh, right now it's about 1750 an hour, including total compensation. Uh, so uh, a living wage, in other words. Um, and this is a requirement for our food service people, for others. I think that every Catholic institution should demand a certain you know, basic standard of anybody it subcontracts to. 
Uh, that's one possible solution to those problems. On the question of unionization, um, I, I agree with the question and comment. How could any Catholic institution oppose it? Um, the, the, the question now has been raised about, well, the federal government shouldn't put its laws on Catholic institutions using the National Labor Relations Act. And I'm sympathetic to, to the idea that we don't want a infringement upon our religious freedom. However, uh, if we don't want those laws to apply, it's incumbent upon our institutions to use our, our own teaching to develop our own ways to guarantee that workers rights are respected. Why, why isn't there um, a, a Catholic university labor board that's, you know, for Catholic universities um, that uh, can um, ensure that workers' rights are protected at these universities? Why don't universities agree to certain standards that they, they will abide by? I think they could do this. Um, there are solutions, I think, that are um, possible. Um, if we, you know, if we um, accept the challenge of this moment, um, I think, um, and this crisis, uh, just in so many ways, um, calls for us to think outside the box about what we want the future to look like. And I think it's important we try to seize this moment. We're in a unique position in Catholic higher ed because we're part of a family. Uh, there are richer and poorer cousins in that family. There are some that are closer than, than others, but we are part of a family. We have a language, we have a set of principles. And by that, we can think beyond a single institution, right? We can think about this in a broader and kind of familial way. And that pushes us and it allows us to do something I don't think that others in higher ed can do, which is to think across our institutions about bigger solutions. And we have a resource in Catholic social teaching to draw upon. Uh, in doing that. Um, I know we're about out of time and yeah. I'll turn it back to you, Mike, but I just noticed my high school teacher is here, Carol Roloff. So hi, Carol. <laughs> so nice of you to be here. Thank you so much. I wouldn't be here without you, Carol. Well, thank you. Carol wrote, I was going to include that. She's a sister of St. Joseph of Carondelet, uh, friends of mine I have there, but she wrote, Guten Tag, Herr McCartan, ich bin mit dir. I am with you. <laughs> That's wonderful. You know, you do, I, I, I think we can do three more minutes. I want you guys to have a closing thought. So, but I'm thinking about, you know, there's a, such an anthropological uh, dissonance between homo economicus being the driving force of Catholic ed and who we are, our family, Joe, you just said this. It's like, we are made to love. We, we, we live in a, you know, if, we, if we're honest about our theological location, we participate in the Trinitarian reality that we're made to love and be loved and belong. And so that's, that needs to be a starting, starting place. I wanted to get Kathleen McNutt, our graduate student assistant, just one quick comment on this. This is important for graduate students. Uh, why was the Georgetown situation different uh, than so many other Catholic university uh, and Jesuit universities in their response to unionization of grad students? Can you comment quickly there, Joe? I think it had a lot to do with our students. I have to give a lot of credit to our students. Um, in 2003, they began a agitation on campus around, they discovered that outsourced janitors were earning less. There were still some that were directly employed at that point. And they discovered this disparity and they were shocked by it. And they got to know the workers, they talked to them. Um, and. Um, you know, these were people who were cleaning up after them. Um, and so they started to, to organize and then to make a demand on the university that it pay them a living wage. Um, and it got to uh, a point by 2005 where they actually engaged in a hunger strike on campus. Some people might have heard of that. Um, and it, it really got everybody's attention and the university thought deeply about the problem and came up with this just employment policy in 2005. At that point, they didn't know it would apply later to adjuncts or graduate assistants, but they just thought it would apply to people like the janitors. But once having created it, then they realized how, 
how important and useful it was. It actually, you know, and I would say in that particular case, what we saw when the students got involved in this is the kind of solidarity, and this is, goes to Dan's comment about, we need more solidarity in our campuses between the senior professors and others, that the students were able to create a sense of solidarity between themselves and the workers and others in the, in the campus that grew out of their agitation. So I credit them and without their agitation, I don't think we would have gotten that policy. But once implemented, I think people saw the logic of it and saw that actually it made Georgetown a better place. Uh, and I believe that that would happen in other places if, if they implemented it as well. That's a good last word, Joe. Thanks. Dan, do you have a final thought? Yeah, I mean, uh, to that point, I think that the, there's no, um, there's no substitute for that kind of a solidarity across a faculty, man. I think it's too, I, I don't know if it's a, a lack of realization at times of, of the way in which the job market has changed so substantially in these areas um, of the, the challenges that, uh, that folks face uh, and that the solidarity is needed. One last thought that I've had uh, on this, uh, Mike, as I've been reading through Joe's wonderful presentation and trying to think through my own thoughts about how to reply is the, the degree to which legal sets the confines for all of these discussions. And, you know, I was thumbing through even the curriculum at Loyola's Law School. And my thought on, on moral theology is not only are we not reading the history of law in law school, we're not even forced to negotiate. Yeah, they take classes on the ethics of law, but there's nothing on a moral, you know, these two disciplines were so historically entwined with one another, but there's no sense of, what would it mean to negotiate law in 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 a interrogation uh, with Catholic moral theology, right? Um, I really think, in many ways, um, uh, changing the game in the legal world might be uh, one of the most fundamental shifts that we have to make. Yeah, that's insightful. I think you're right. Um, I'm gonna let the I'm gonna save the last word for Pope Francis. Okay, so and he's critiquing in Fratelli Tutti the insatiable, almost rapacious, what, uh, Leviathan of neoliberalism. And to follow up with your, your thought on, on solidarity, Joe, and Dan, implicitly yours, he says this, solidarity means that lives, that the lives of all are prior to the appropriation of goods by a few. It also means combating the structural causes of poverty, inequality, the lack of work, land and housing, the denial of social and labor rights. It means confronting the destructive effects of the empire of money. Now, he had an economist counsel him on this document, but I think what he's, what he's, um, what he's vocalizing yet again is that the economy is supposed to be for people, not the other way around. And so we have a rich tradition that really says this. And I think if I'm hearing you, Dan, we need to use it. And if I'm hearing you, Joe, there are ways to do that. So everybody, let's put our hands together for our guests. And thank you all for coming. Blessings, a blessed Lent to you, and have a nice week. We'll see you online, hopefully on March 11th, March 23rd, and good night. Thanks, Megan. <laughs>